Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is one of Germany's leading commentators on the latest trends in the digital world. In fact, as one well-known newspaper said, he's the man who's given the digital age here in Germany a face. And here he is, Sascha Lobo, with that face. Thank you for coming along today, Sascha. Yeah. yeah. I'm afraid it's more like I've given that movement a haircut than a face, but... Uh... Okay. We'll talk about the face, we'll talk about the haircut in just a second. So, Zasha Lobo, iconic blogger or nerd king, as he's also being called, whichever way you look at it, he has certainly made a huge name for himself as an expert on what he likes to call the digital sphere and the impact that it is having on our lives. So, Zasha, I'd like to begin with the first question. In one of your relatively recent blogs, uh, you talked about people who see the internet as a digital instrument. On the one hand, they are so they are people who use the digital world, the, the internet for sending messages or making purchases, commerce and all that kind of thing. On the other hand, there are people who see the, and this is the term you used, who see the internet as a digital home. I'm guessing that you are in the second category and I'd like to ask you what a digital home is. A digital home, I don't know if it's the right expression in English, to be honest, but a digital home is something... Um, which happens when you put your life in parts into the internet. When the internet is a, um, one important part of your social life, or your, of your cultural life, of the things you consume, of the, thing, of the, the way you, you buy things and consume things. Um, so I think there are some people who think the instant internet is an instrument mm -hmm. you just use for doing your... Uh, flight uh, bookings or something like that, or for banking. And there are other people who literally live in the internet, who have some sort of social life and cultural life in the internet itself, together with other people. And if you, if you live and you interact in that kind of way in the internet that you can call it, at least partly your digital home, is it a friendly place? Well, is the world a friendly place? That is the question Good behind question. it. Yeah, yeah. And I think you could argue from both sides. Um, I think in this special case, the answer would be that depends. And it depends from yourself and the, the space and the websites and the services you're using right now and the people who are on the other side of the mm -hmm. screen. So um, is it the internet a, a, an evil or a good place or a friendly place? Is, uh, the, the same question as, is the world a friendly place? Certainly, uh, uh, one observation of yours recently, you say that an awful lot of people in Germany, because you're saying that, you know, it depends on the perspective you're coming from. Yes. A lot of people in Germany, in one of your interviews, you said, uh, if they go on the internet, they feel as though they're going to be mucked about, they're going to be messed about, that something bad is going to happen. Why do so many people in Germany have those kind of fears? Those angst, angst, that German word. <laughs> the reason might lie in Germany itself and the Germans. Um, I'm half German, half Argentinian, but mm -hmm. feeling like 150% German, even more German than most Germans, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but I do have something which is called Migrationshintergrund in, oh, yeah. in Germany, yeah. which will be something. So you're, you're a member of a migrant community. Ma and I'm not a member of the migrant that's community. That's the way you're classified. Here yeah, in no, but yeah, th that's the way I'm classified, and yeah. that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have a migration background, you would call it, yeah. um, but I don't feel like that. I'm feeling like that. I'm born in Germany. I'm raised, uh, I was raised in Germany by my parents. And just because my father's from Argentina um, doesn't have anything to do with my state uh, of being a German. And uh, that's part of the problem, um, because being German has something to do with not being anything else. And... Um, that's quite interesting that it's, uh, it relates to the digital world too. Um, the question I, I, I have to put to myself is, could you be a typical German at the same time and as you are an internet citizen? citizen? Um, and I, I think the, the answer up to now is more a no than a yes. Um, I think that Germans don't, don't uh, relate to the internet. Well, just explain that a little bit more. What's the contradiction between being a citizen on the internet and being a typical German? Where does it not fit? The first thing is the language. Um, most Germans spe speak uh, English quite well, um, but um, they're not emotionally involved in English uh, uh, conversation. So um, you, you just... Uh, uh, 
hanging around with other Germans and that m is not a, a mixture uh, which uh, brings you forward, I'm afraid. So this, this uh, huge world of internet for most Germans is just the German internet. That's interesting. And, um, well, there, there are some Swiss people and some Austrians, about three million or something, and that, don't, that doesn't uh, uh, make the it thing... It doesn't add much, uh, yeah, <laughs> necessarily. It, it yeah. adds something, but yeah, not that something. much. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, so if you're in the internet and the English-speaking world, you have like the whole word to your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And if you're German, you have just the German world to your fingertips. And that's a, it's a huge difference. And the second thing is, is that um, I think Germans have uh, some sort of um, angst uh, or um, fear, a fear, mm -hmm. some sort of fear towards new things. Not that they're neophobic or something like that, but they are just looking at new things and new developments. But, well, will this really be better than the old stuff we had and which functions like hell? So um, I think it's quite complicated between the internet and Germans. And you see that in politics, especially. Sasha Lobo, who was born in Berlin back in 1975, uh, so the wall was still up. What can you remember from those, the, those early days of yours when there was still a wall around the city you were born in? Well, it's quite a funny feeling when you uh, walk down a street and you walked on and on and straight on and then suddenly the world came to an end. Yeah. There was uh, the wall yeah. and you couldn't get further. And it was funny for me, especially when we had some holiday or something and we... Uh, made a vacation to uh, Western Germany and you just could leave the town. Mm. What a crazy feeling. <laughs> <laughs> the world doesn't end at the end of the town. That's, uh, that's great. That's, uh, yeah. uh, you, of course, you've been through two of the... Uh, or you've been affected in a, in a very major way by two of the great changes that we've had in, in, in modern history or recent history, which has been the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, and the discovery of the World Wide Web and the, and the Internet. Uh, tell me about your first experiences with the Internet and with computers as a young guy. Uh, to be honest, I was a terrible late adopter. Uh -huh. um, so you I weren't had, a digital my, my native? Very, no, I'm, I'm not a digital native at all. Mm. Um, uh, my very first contact uh, with the internet was in 1996, when someone showed me the, uh, the internet and uh, I, have, I had to be around that place for some hours. Um, and I clicked here and clicked there and I saw some, uh, well... Uh, very low quality pornography and then mm. I thought well this internet is nothing for me and it was up until 1999 when I got my second chance to to see what the internet could bring to me. It's very late. <laughs> yeah very late. My, my, I had my first email address 1999 mm -hmm. and my mother had been adopting email like three years earlier so um, it, it's quite funny but then in 1999, I saw this internet and this, this boom, this new economy boom, which was there. I was just uh, 24 years old and I, I, I wrote some mails and looked closely what the internet could do for me, of course. Yeah. Uh, and like some weeks later, I had to uh, found an agency about the internet, of course, because I felt like an expert. I was uh, 25 years old in 2000 and it was uh, clearly the internet had to be for my uh, of, well, wealth and stuff like that. You, you, I mean, you, you are a, an, an expert. You're viewed as a guru. You're viewed as an iconic blogger. These are terms that are used about you. you know, how have you established this expertise? How deep does it go? Well, first of all, I have to say that it uh, has something to do with my haircut. I have to be honest with that, <laughs> because um, this haircut functions as some sort of uh, um, iconic, as you said, yeah. symbol mm -hmm. for this guy who knows about the internet. And it's quite funny that it functions too in everyday life. I'm entering a bar like the second time yeah. in two weeks and people tend to think I'm always at this bar, this is my uh, uh, main bar or something. And um, it's more or less a thing with this uh, internet expertise. Um, I, have, I had uh, written a book in 2006, which was called uh, We Call It Work. Uh, 
yeah. and which examined the connections between the development of the digital world and um, how we work and how we, uh, the economy is evolving. And um, this book um, catapulted me into the television. And when there's some, some guy in television who speaks about the internet mm -hmm. and has a crazy haircut, um, people get irritated in Germany and they think, oh, what's that? And so I got uh, um, like world famous uh, uh, at German journalists, uh, and this, uh, this so was you, it. You were world famous for German, among the German among uh, the German internet uh, community. Uh, yes, yeah. that's, that's the, the German media. That's well yeah. put. Yeah, and in the German media, which is by uh, in no means the rest of the world, but which is quite uh, interesting. Yeah. So it was a great example of branding. Yeah, well, of marketing wanna, of how to sell yourself. Yeah, yeah um, I, I, I don't want to be back. Uh, uh, um, decent, but it, but I, I think uh, it has to do with the way I uh, think about the digital world, and mm. uh, I'm investing uh, huge loads of time uh, in the internet. I'm thinking about the internet, and I'm writing it down in quite a, a and, big. And your latest book, Zasha, is called "The Internet: A Blessing or a Curse." Yes. Yeah? What, what conclusion did you come to in the book? Is it a blessing or is it a curse? It could be both, of course. Explain. Um, yeah. Um, what's the I blessing? Have to what's the curse? It, it mm -hmm. depends from your point of view. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the internet always has done good things. So for me, definitely, uh, it's uh, uh, it's not a curse. But if you see some someone who just opened a bookstore with physical books uh, around the corner, um, and this guy. <coughs> has no chance to survive with his beloved bookstore the next five or six years because I, I don't think that bookstores, there, there will be like 8,000 bookstores in, in Germany over the next years. Uh, I'm, I think uh, part of them has to close down and that's um, the, the fall of the internet. So for this guy, uh, the internet definitely is a curse. And for you, it is a blessing? More or less, but uh, even this depends because mm -hmm. um, I make my living out of the internet, but it had brought to me uh, some complicated stuff too. For example, um, that everyone, uh, if someone wants to, everyone could shout at me on Twitter or on why, Facebook. Why are you so unpopular on the, on the internet? Well, you're popular and unpopular at the same time. You're talking about yourself. Yes. You're talking about the opportunities it has brought you. Yes. Uh, but there's an awful lot of sort of bad vibes about Sasha Lobo on the internet as I well. I think it's not a Sasha Lobo phenomenon, but an internet phenomenon. If you Absolutely. see the Pirate Party, mm -hmm. they're controversial like hell, and it's more or less the same with me. Um, I think um, when, what social media has brought to us, and social media is the, act, the, the state right now of the internet, what social media has brought is the ability to look into someone's head. What right now is uh, going on in someone, what someone's head, his, his ideas and the... the I, I don't want anybody to look inside my head. Well, yeah, then Am you I don't the wrong have person to use, for the internet. You, you yeah. shouldn't use Facebook. There is yeah. always someone who just writes down what he thinks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, the, the, the social media um, thing is that you just get rid of anything you're thinking right now. Mm -hmm. And there is... There are quite mixed emotions in there. There are good emotions, there are the bad feelings, and there are towards anyone who have, exposes have, himself. Have, have you had to develop a very thick skin to yes. cope with the thing? How do you Definitely. do how, how has that happened? Tell me how that well, has happened. Well, it's happened step by step. Mm. I had to see myself as some sort of social experiment. I had to see myself as uh, the guy with the haircut who talks about the internet in television, which mm. is what I got more or less uh, known for. Um, and I had to see myself, well, the reaction of this guy who thinks I'm the um, baddest man around um, and expresses it on, on Twitter. Um, this guy is not talking about me, but talking about some sort of media figure, uh, a guy who explains the internet on television. And it's not me as a person. And I have to, uh, um, to separate this, these two, two, two people the guy who is in television with a haircut, and myself. So you have two personalities. You almost have a, a, a split personality. More or less. I have two poles of personality. Two poles. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one, uh, one personality, two poles.
Now, another of Sasha Lobo's books uh, that he's already mentioned is We Call It Work. It was all about so-called digital bohemians and their freelance lifestyle. It sounds good, as a concept at least. Uh, let's have a look at the reality. Maya Lasarski is an online worker. She has an office job at an IT firm, but also earns money selling her own scarves and other products on the internet. Her third job involves editing audiobooks. I might be sitting by the lake when posting my stuff online or while editing an audiobook. I can take my work with me everywhere, thanks to technology. Welcome to the modern world of work. The flexibility involved is making it an attractive option for people across the world, eager to sell their own products and services. Sociologist Torsten Fischer gets jobs via a cloud-based online platform. What I want is to do things that I'm interested in, not with someone or other telling me what to do. But that freedom also means responsibility, especially when you have kids to feed, like Maya Latsarski. Current welfare systems favour the salaried workforce. Cloud workers work from home. But many struggle to prevail on what has become a global labour market, especially in the IT sector. A German developer costs as much as five Croats, and a Croatian developer costs as much as five Indians. As a German developer, that puts me in a tight spot. The question is whether I can be competitive. It's both the quantity and manner of work that's changing rapidly. IBM gets bids from freelancers with their own programming solutions. But only the best one will be paid. It's an increasingly common situation. Which is why unions in Germany are now calling for a rethink on the sustainability of internet working. We need to see flexibility within a secure framework. If I'm working strictly on a flexible basis and don't know if I'll be paid for my work, I have no more guarantee of making a living. That's something digital natives don't want. But with traditional jobs disappearing in many sectors, what choice do they have? A growing number of online workers will be looking for work on the global marketplace. We've reached a point where there's a need to change the political organization of work. A global mass of online workers to choose from might be a dream for employers. But is it an ideal future for digital freelancers? Sasha Lobo has just been telling me about how digital bohemians are people who work freely and independently in the field of culture. Well, who try to do who that. Who try yeah. to do that. It all, it all sounds very good, but the, the, the trade unionist in that report, he, he, uh, he says that what people need is flexibility in a secure framework. Is that something that has any meaning in the modern world now? Yes, I definitely think so, because um, the flexibility is already there by technology, techno, technological means, mm. but um, the security is not at all there, not even in Germany, which is one of the most social, secured uh, countries in the world. Um, but how, if you, how, do, how do we create that kind of security? How well, do we if give I knew people? the answer, but <laughs> I, I think an answer has to be found. For yeah. example, what will be in the future when, uh, um, when uh, people retire who always worked uh, um, independently in culture business and... Uh, uh, don't have any spare money or something like that, what will happen with them? Mm -hmm. um, that's a question which up to now is unanswered. And, and mm -hmm. I'm expecting a political answer to that, mm -hmm. as a good German, of course. You're expecting a political answer. You're expecting the politicians to get up and do it for you. Yeah. No, not only for me, yeah. but, uh, but for all the hundreds of thousands of people who work in this mm -hmm. way we call the digital bohemia, yeah. That's interesting. And what would you say to the software developer in that report who says, look, the, the software developer in Croatia is five times cheaper and then the software developer in India is five times cheaper again. I'm going to be priced out of the market. I, I simply can't exist. Um, that's a problem. That uh, straight out said it's a, it's a problem. 
And I have uh, uh, to say that the, the solution for this problem mm. has to be an, a, a one which involves all of the society. Maybe, and it could be, that parts of the uh, um, working force just goes to other countries and we can't do anything against it. Mm. Um, so we have to adopt, adopt to these, uh, um, the, these kinds of, well, offshore working, cloud working style. M maybe some, some professions aren't uh, possible in, in the near future in Germany anymore. Mm. And when we talk about what Germany is good at, I mean, everybody associates with Germany, BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, yes. pharmaceutical companies, machine tools, engineering, all these kind of things. Uh, why is Germany good at doing all those things? And why has Germany not got an Amazon, an eBay, and a Facebook or whatever? <laughs> That's a good question, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, I think uh, Germans have uh, a lot of sympathy, a lot of sympathy for things you can touch, technology you can touch. Germans are not exactly uh, um, hostile uh, against technology, mm -hmm. which is uh, often sad, but they are they are quite um, well. They they can't relate to technology which is invisible which is a huge difference. And in addition, there is a, some sort of, well, I wouldn't call it anti-Americanism, but I would call it uh, uh, skeptic towards, they're skeptic towards America and the US. Okay. And like 95% <clears throat> of the companies uh, you, you relate to on social media and internet mm -hmm. are from California. So. Uh, th this, is a, this is some sort of problem for many Germans. Mm -hmm. we, we've talked about the Berlin Wall and we've talked about so, you know, notions of freedom in, in the world that we live mm -hmm. in. Uh, has, has the internet made, us, uh, made the world we live in a freer place? Have you got concerns there? I'm afraid uh, to, to this uh, question I don't have an answer to. Um, there is a great discussion about it right now yeah. because the internet could be used for uh, ways to make the, the public uh, or the world more democratic, but it also could be used to suppress people and for a better form of surveillance. There are people, uh, intellectuals, who argue that uh, the internet is one giant surveillance machine. Mm -hmm. And they're not totally wrong, I'm afraid. Um, so there's, on the one hand, uh, the blessing of more democracy, which could be possible, and on the other hand, the, the curse of uh, 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 quite an, a horrible surveillance, even in, in totalitarian states. Yeah, I mean, people you begin to use the word Orwellian for big companies that know, know an awful lot more about us than we would well, I like them to I know. Wouldn't, I wouldn't use it for companies, I would, I would use it for, for states and for governments. So you're um, more worried about states than you are about companies? Well, I'm, I'm seeing, an, uh, f uh, for example, in the WikiLeaks scandal, uh, I, I saw that uh, the companies are not the, the, the problem uh, in fighting WikiLeaks. Um, the government was, and they forced companies like uh, Twitter or uh, uh, PayPal to act in exactly the way they chose to act. Uh, so um, I really see a problem in the surveillance machine of the internet, mm -hmm. but I think the problem is just a tiny part corporations and one far bigger part uh, the state itself. Okay, just give me a one word answer to this question. Yeah. As somebody who can remember the Berlin Wall in the city where you were yeah. born, uh, do you feel freer now than you did 10 years ago or less free because of the internet? I feel freer, but that's just for me. Okay, okay. Um, We've got, we're talking a little bit about politics now here, uh, and uh, we have a new political party here in Germany, the Pirate Party. It's been making its mark here in the country in recent years, doing uh, so well in some regional polls that some commentators were predicting that it could win as much as 10% of the vote in this autumn's uh, national elections. In recent months, though, the Pirates have been struggling uh, to keep their ship on course. This old estate outside Leipzig hosted a key gathering of the Pirate Party in February. The meeting was called to assess the party's poor showing at a recent state election. 19-year-old Till Zimmermann was the election campaign coordinator involved. He now had to explain how the party could go from top to flop and failed to make the 5% hurdle in Lower Saxony. 
It was a pretty makeshift campaign. We all worked spontaneously, and there was not much planning. We lost our way a bit. In September 2011, the Pirates took the Berlin state elections by storm, winning 8.9% of the vote and 15 seats. They subsequently entered a further three state legislatures, Saarland, Schleswig-Holstein and North Rhine-Westphalia. Voters across Germany were clearly being won over by the Pirates' focus on grassroots democracy and complete transparency. First, the Pirates managed to get their issues on the agenda, but then internal problems overshadowed those issues, and the party itself and its leaders became the main focus. Policy conflicts and poor PR have seen a slump in the party's popularity, down to 2% nationwide from 11% a year ago. The consensus from the February meeting was that the party needs to become more like its established rivals. People are voting for new parties because they want to see the political setup challenged. We have to focus on that and communicate the message via personalities. That would mark a radical break from the grassroots principles of the party. Until now, the message and slogan had been issues instead of faces. Executive committee members in the Pirate Party always have to be legitimized by a member's vote. That means the discussions ended before people could actually take part in them. Transparency and co-determination have always been the keywords for the Pirates. But the realities of everyday politics mean the party first has to overcome the haggling and horse trading over people and posts. Sasha Lobo, when the when the pirates emerged on the scene a couple of years ago, did you did you welcome that? Um, at first, I was a little skeptic about them because mm. they um, evolved from some sort of uh, um, well, very uh, uh, skeptic people around the uh, um, a copyright, uh, which is. Uh, explanation for the name pirates they exactly. named themselves um, uh, after this expression but but then I welcomed them indeed because they brought in a new movement and a new very uh, internet like movement to politics which in Germany definitely has to change mm -hmm. so they had this um, uh, well they had this promise of change which is like worldwide known in politics transparency <laughs> Yeah. Not, not only transparency, that this was one of the, the key advantages by the pirates, but, but uh, it was mm -hmm. the feeling of there's someone, well, changing the way politics are presented to the public. Yeah, that sounds good, but I mean, it's very easy to say the old politicians are stuck in the mud and they're stuck in their ways. Let's do something differently, but it's uh, how exactly do you right. do the difference? It's exactly right. Mm -hmm. It was very easy to just uh, um, talk about this thing, like... Uh, um, transparency or uh, renewing the way politi politics is working, um, but it's hard to do it. Yeah. And um, up to now, the pirates, uh, the pirate party, just failed to present a way which the public can relate to, a way of uh, changing politics. Mm -hmm. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't presented anything which resembles uh, a, a way uh, politics could be dealt with. There, there, there was something called liquid democracy. What, what, what did that mean? Well, that, that basically means that you, uh, you can vote on very small decisions in the political system and not only every four years yeah. uh, um, at the elections. And you could vote for uh, another guy or another uh, woman um, and just transfer your vote or you could vote yourself personally mm -hmm. by, for any, uh, anything which is politically debated right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's not a, f a, a, a way uh, liquid, liquid democracy is working right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you talk about every four years voting for parties, we are, we're going to have a national election here in Germany this yes. coming autumn. And to get into the Bundestag, to the, into the national parliament, you need to get over 5% yes. of the vote. Do you think the pirates are going to make that this time round, or are they I'm going to fade not. into irrelevancy? I'm afraid not. There's a very small uh, um, possibility to, for them to enter the Bundestag, mm. uh, which would be um, if one of the main figures who resigned a year ago, Marina Weisband, mm -hmm. Uh, would uh, be in front of uh, of the pirate party, but she's 
she has some sort of burnout or something like she that. She was here on the show and she yes. didn't sound very happy with her role as the leader of the party. Yeah, she's yes. thrown she's, in the towel, she's, more or less. Uh, 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 quite a young woman, but exactly. I, I think uh, she would have the, the, the power and the potential to, to lead the Pirate Party um, if she doesn't want to. Well, uh, that's the problem of the party. OK, we've been talking about the Pirate Party. You have been involved with a more conventional party, the Opposition Social Democrats, a more traditional party here in Germany. Yes. What's the relationship? What do you offer the Social Democrats? Well, I'm, I'm some sort of friend uh, from Social Democrats and the Green Party right mm. b uh, between them because um, when Chancellor Kohl, Helmut Kohl, <laughs> uh, um, stepped down in uh, 1998, um, I... I noticed some sort of you can't change politics. The 16 years before, politics for me were some grey, always the same stuff presented in Tages show mm -hmm. and on the uh, evening news. On the evening news, and it was always the same that something, uh, someone told us, well, the pendler pauschale would be raised or not, and mm -hmm. this this stuff of of uh, uh, um, uh, theatre, political theatre, uh, was my. Uh, uh, well, I couldn't relate to that. Okay. So when uh, the, the Social Democrats and the Green Party together started an, a new government in '98, I, I noticed, well, you can't change society with politics. It's meant to do that this way. And that's why I, uh, I, I was like Social Democratic and Green impregnated with, with the politics uh, out there. Mm -hmm. Describe the change. Well, the change that, that you would like to see, if there was a new Social there Democrat been... Green government, what would happen in concrete terms that Sasha Lobo would think, yeah, I can identify with that? That's a very difficult question because um, uh, the Social Democrats and the Green Party together hadn't been always on my mind these days, to mm -hmm. put it mildly. <laughs> um, but uh, the hope... Uh, I have would be that they they were steering towards a more open society, uh, from gay marriage to uh, uh, which is like uh, I think a w worldwide topic right now. Absolutely. Um, yeah. uh, uh, to from gay marriage to uh, something like uh, um, immigration politics, and um, okay. this was thing that I would appreciate which uh, when they would change. Okay. One very quick question: Why do you live in Berlin? You could live anywhere. When it was time cancer. to decide where I live, where I live, I, uh, Berlin was the place where most things happened. That's why. And Sasha Lobo is going to tell us what it is really like at Soho House. Well, right in the beginning, I had had been there, and it was like uh, I knew every second uh, guy or woman uh, were there. So I had the feeling of there's some pulls of the city in the Soho house. So there uh, really were young, creative, dynamic people running around, all talking to each other and interacting with each other. Well, first of all, there, people, there were people I know, and that's uh, the best thing about a club. Yeah. Um, but it changed a little bit, uh, and uh, I, I don't know if I... Uh, I'm not going there as often as in the beginning, because mm. right now there's, um, well, quite... Uh, from time to time, there are famous people or something, and it's more or less a tourist attraction uh, than a real club for people who live in Berlin. I see. But you are still a member. How did, how did you become a member? We, we, there's a long waiting list, we just heard. Yeah. I've been there quite early, and uh, with the right haircut, you can be a member <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Is the haircut here to stay? Yes, I think so. Mm. I have... Uh, I um, Well, I got the haircut at... Uh, October the 2nd, 2006, mm -hmm. right before um, showing my book, uh, we call it work. Mm -hmm. So I already have like six years and I don't see any reason to change it. Mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to bear it every day except in the mirror, so ask my wife. What's it like in the morning? It's like a rainbow pony, very fluffy and <laughs> uh, until I... Uh, put it up with hairspray and yeah. then it's like flexible and you can do anything to it, it stays the way. Tell me this, um, you're a little bit punky up top, yeah? Uh, and a lot of people sort of associate you with a punk, yeah? Um, does that, when, when you're at Soho House, do you feel as though you're in an exclusive elitist place? Well, 
I, I don't have, I don't know what elitist feeling might be. It's, mm. it's quite an, uh, it, it does cost quite a lot of money to be their member, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, about 1,200 euros a year, but um, I don't think that this has any to, anything to do with elitist or something like that. So, okay. um, well, the, the haircut uh, fits right in the saw house, let's put it this way. How have you changed down the years from there? I mean, you keep telling me about what you were like 2004, 2005, 2006. Uh, how, how has the world changed for Sasha Lobo in the last uh, decade or so? I married one and a half years ago, so mm -hmm. that's, that's changed a lot to me. <laughs> but did, did you meet your wife on the internet? Yes, of course, on Twitter. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't marry a wife, uh, which, I, uh, no. I, I met her on Twitter yeah. and it was great because it was like love on the first sight mm -hmm. uh, in a digital way. Um, and then we met in person and mm -hmm. everything was clear. It's interesting, we're, we're very different people because I can't even begin to imagine how that, uh, how that works. Yeah. Well, you have to get a feeling how the internet uh, presents you with some, just some pixels, the very personality of uh, a person. And if you can manage to, to understand that, then you can fall in love on the internet. It's possible. Wonderful. Is the net at the beginning, in the middle or at the end? In the very, very beginning. And I, I hope that it will evolve into something even better than it's right now. Okay. Sasha Lobo, we're going to go, we'll move on to our traditional Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show. Uh, are you a nerd or are you normal? I'm between both sides and that's <laughs> the way I uh, earn my money. I'm explaining the nerds, how the normal uh, world is uh, functioning and uh, the way around. What excites you more, security or uncertainty? Uncertainty. Uh, is the web a place of comfort or a place of pain? It's both, definitely. I've uh, felt great comfort and great pain and uh, sometimes even at the same time. Okay, on that note we'll leave it there. Sasha Lobo, thank you very much. Uh, that's your lot this time round here on Talking Germany. Uh, our guest has been the very informative, sometimes controversial internet guru, uh, Sasha Lobo. If you've missed any of our shows in the past, check out our archive and if you've enjoyed today's show as much as I have, then do come back next week and you can also check out my blog on the internet site. Until next week, bye bye and tschüss. <laughs>